everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to a uh, morning panel, last day of the GSV conference. Uh, I'm Michael Horn, the uh, head of strategy at the Entangled Group. Uh, excited about this conversation. Uh, most people don't know that I'm a, uh, I guess, a, a recovering musician is the right word. Um, oh, no, but, uh, I, I, I never recover, but I don't have enough time to play anymore because of kids. But uh, uh, so striking the right note, the democratization of music learning. Got a really uh, terrific panel uh, here that I'm personally giddy about. So uh, all the way at the end, uh, we have uh, Ingolf Wunder um, uh, from Apasio, uh, which he'll tell us about, Stephen Cox uh, from Take Lessons, and uh, Roger Brown, the uh, president of the uh, Berkeley College of Music. Uh, so I'll dive right in and, and maybe start with you, Ingolf, uh, and we'll work our way down. Uh, I'd love you to just frame so everyone knows uh, who you are, the, you know, the, the company that you've started, uh, in, case, in your case, obviously, Roger, the school that you lead. Uh, and but not just simply from your perspective, why do people come to you and actually take lessons or, or, or enroll uh, uh, with you? Well, this is, has to do with our big mission. Um, our, our big mission is to bring value and depth back to music, which is a quite big mission. And uh, we choose, and the only way to achieve that is education. We need to match the right students with the right teachers at the right times of their life to infuse the passion and to teach them why you're doing music. And we are happy that we, uh, we have incredible talent already, uh, although we just started, so we are pre-seed. <laughs> Um, um, so, uh, so people come to us to have access to teachers that they didn't have before, and that's what it should be. Uh, good morning. My name is Stephen Cox, founder and CEO of TakeLessons.com. Uh, we've traveled about four blocks to be with you today. Our office is right down the street, so for those of you who are not uh, from San Diego, welcome on behalf of all of us that are. Uh, Take Lessons, um, we help consumers find a great and perfect instructor and then actually take lessons both uh, privately, either online or actually in person. So we have instructors all over the nation who will physically show up at your house to give your kids lessons. Um, and we, we help them uh, on that side. And then on the, uh, invest, or on the um, instructor side, we very uh, plainly help them make a better living doing what they love to do. I don't know if you heard, but sometimes it's difficult to make a living playing music. Uh, we try to make that easier for, for our instructor base. Our, uh, we have two products. Again, the first one is a marketplace for matching for local um, private instruction. And the second one is a, an online product. It's a subscription product where a consumer can take unlimited online live stream group classes for less than 20 bucks a month. And so we've done that to basically service, back to your question on uh, kind of the markets that we serve, uh, we find that there are, uh, you know, kind of, if you take a look at the funnel of people who like music, um, everyone here love music, yes? <laughs> yes, so you're kind of up here in the big funnel, right? And everyone's kind of this dream, um, maybe similar to you, hey, yeah. I'd love to, love to play. Um, very few people get down here to the private kind of private lessons business, and then even fewer of those probably make it to, to like a, a like to Berkeley, uh, where they're actually good enough to to, to do that full time. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to help uh, the big fat middle we call it the people up at the top who are interested in beginning uh, mainly who want to either uh, they want their kids to be involved in music because they understand the value of music, or um, or they're older and they've missed that growing up and they have that emotional pull uh, that music draws uh, to them. And so we try to serve, uh, serve that market. Um, and some people go on to you know, com compete in American Idol, some people go on to prestigious universities, and there's a big group of people, I think um, a, a guy was reading, we ask our uh, students, why do you want to take lessons? And I think the most raw, true uh, answer that I heard was when I was looking at this even yesterday, a 17-year-old, uh, he was taking guitar, and he said, I want to find a girlfriend. <laughs> so, uh, so we service those people as well. <laughs> Roger. So uh, I'm the president of Berkeley College of Music, which is in Boston, not in, uh, in California. Um, we, our claim to fame is that we were founded to teach jazz and contemporary music as opposed to Western European classical music. Uh, we were the first institution to embrace jazz as an art form, and that has created a, an improvisational culture that I think makes us a little different than the typical music school. 
And one of the things we used to do was correspondence courses for people who wanted to study with us but couldn't be in Boston. And I, I gave an honorary doctor to the great Afro-Cuban pianist Chucho Valdez who said, I studied with Berkeley through correspondence courses. Um, Building on that tradition, we started a press, so we published books by faculty, and then we started an online school back in 2002, which has grown to be the biggest online music school in the world, serving about 10,000 paying students a year, 2.4 million MOOC students through Coursera and edX, and we have the, the largest collegiate YouTube channel in the world. Uh, we recently surpassed MIT and Stanford I like to joke that we're in a competition, but we haven't told anyone else we're competing with them so that they don't wake up and so But our premise is YouTube content gets people introduced to music for free. MOOCs give people a six-week course for free without interpersonal reactions with a professor. And then you can pay a relatively small amount and get in a co cohort of 10 to 20 people and study with a Berkeley faculty member. You can actually earn your full undergraduate degree or your master's degree at about 64% less tuition than it would cost if you came to the physical campus. So Ingolf, I, I'll, I'll start with you on this question and then I'm very curious to everyone's reactions uh, and, and thoughts on this, which is what do you perceive as the central challenge in music learning right now? Well, the, the challenge is that we um, not many people notice that, that we live really in dark ages when it comes to value and quality music. Because the thing is, we live in two, 120 years of recorded history. We know, how, we know how the people were playing, composing in all the genres in 1905 and what we do now. So if you compare these two, we have done something wrong along the way. So. What we need to do is we need to teach the kids from the start why they are doing it. What's music? Why they're playing this or that harmony melody? How they phrase? Get away from the computer-like playing just notes and having, instead of notes, gestures, expressions, and all of those things that all the great jazz pianists from the past, all the great classical pianists from the past had, and we lost that. So this is a big, big, big challenge. I see two or three main challenges. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, first, this is directly speaking to beginners, which is the market that we serve mostly. Uh, the first challenge that I see is substitution. Frankly, there's a lot of other things that are requiring our time or requiring parents' time. And you take a look at everything from sports to the iPad to video games. And it is, uh, it is a, a quest to find the time and to get people interested to start with. And I think video games in particular have done very, very well at uh, kind of the second challenge of making things fun. And I think that that's something that we see in our business is there's kind of two lines of thinking with respect to some of the instructors we work with. The first group is kind of very rudimentary, but kind of by the book and, and uh, kind of looking to do kind of the um, hardcore training. You've got another group of uh, uh, sometimes uh, younger instructors who they just want to make things fun, right? They want to make things interesting. They're actually using some of the gamification sort of processes that you see in, in uh, video games or apps. And what we find is the teachers who do that sort of uh, learning, they keep their students longer. So the retention factor is, is uh, greater than what you find in, in the first group. And the third is cost. Uh, you know, a group of private lessons will run somewhere around 200, 250 bucks a month for kind of one-on-one -on -one private lessons. And that's what we found when we introduced this new product. Uh, we introduced a, a price point of 20 bucks for kind of group classes, which I think is kind of similar to kind of uh, this, uh, this uh, group to, to where you can put more people in and make it more affordable. And um, we're signing up 40 to one on the people of, of that sort of group, because again, uh, cost is a barrier for a lot of people. I think I would uh, identify two big challenges. Um, I think the story of the last couple hundred years has been substituting technology for human interaction. The reason, you know, try going to a bank and finding a teller who will help you or call your wireless company and try to get assistance, that's made things cheaper and more accessible. 
But we still in the music education world believe, like at, if you come to Berkeley, you get a one hour private lesson every week with a full faculty member at the institution, not a TA or someone else. Uh, and that's the way it's been done for probably 500 years, which is great, but it's expensive, especially if you put it in a major city that is expensive to live in where the faculty need to be paid well and they need health benefits. And so I think that the, the whole issue of, uh, you know, the cost of higher education in general, but even the most expensive colleges outside of music don't give a student a one-on-one -on -one private lesson with a faculty member every week. So part of our, our logic around online education is to see if we can really bend the cost curve, not by 5%, but as I said, by 64%. Um, the other thing I would say about music education, and again, this, I, I come at this as more a garage band drummer who was in a jazz fusion band. The fun for me was always playing music with other people. And sometimes the way we teach music is a little bit like if we were teaching basketball and we said to students, you need to learn to do passing drills and dribbling drills for four years before you ever get to play in a game. But pick up basketball is what makes it fun. And then you do some drills and you learn some skills. So I think one of the things Berkeley pioneered was immediately putting people in ensembles and letting them play music. And the beauty of contemporary popular music is that most people can actually make something that sounds like music within a few weeks. And they can feel some identity as a musician and you hope that they will progress from there and take an interest in more sophisticated music, music with it's got more, uh, you know, more, more complexity in terms of its harmony or its, its melody or its rhythm. So I think that part of the, the, the challenge is this idea of, uh, there is an old school view that, you know, you're gonna wrap your knuckles if you play a wrong note. And, uh, and um, I think, you know, frankly, uh, if, if we taught basketball that way, we wouldn't be very good at, at basketball. Yeah, so, it, so let's, let's dive deeper into this, because uh, so there, there are a couple elements. Um, I'm, I'm hearing the engagement fun piece and the why as a constant theme through all of this. The other side I'm hearing of it, though, is uh, the substitution piece, the competition piece. And I, I'd love you guys to all reflect on what's happening in music education in schools. What, what, what has changed, what has not changed, what is perceived to have changed? Do we have it at the same levels that we do? Has the tenor of it changed? What, what's the state of music education today outside of the uh, entrepreneurial efforts? And, and I, I would say all three of you are engaged yeah. in entrepreneurial efforts uh, uh, yeah. that, that you all see right now. I think it's easy to decry the, uh, the, the decay of music education in the public school system in this country. And Ingolf and I were talking about Europe. We tend to idolize Europe and think they, they're very good at it, but uh, I guess it's a similar issue there. But I would take a contrarian point of view and say the reason American music has been so popular around the world, I mean, you go to Malaysia and you're gonna hear music that's influenced by the Delta blues and hip hop. And the reason is that it's not because those musicians learned to do that in school. It's because they formed independent groups or bands. They learned in church. The secret, part of the secret to American music is not schools, it's churches, where a lot of people learn to play. And church music is super competitive. If you're not a good drummer, some 12-year-old will come along and unseat you. So you have to work at staying good and strong to, 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 uh, to be a church musician. So, um, you know, it's not good. Our public, school, uh, our public schools were better at music education a century ago than they are today, and that's sad. Yeah, I agree with Roger. It's, it's uh, what, what we see in our business is we would obviously all love to see more music in school. Um, I find it a, uh, a challenge for our, uh, I guess, our educational system to think the same way. And so as an entrepreneur, I look at that and, and just uh, make a decision that irrespective of what the school systems do, we're going to still go try to build a big business and help people out. Um, and so uh, the demand is still there. And if schools don't want to fulfill that, uh, then uh, companies and individual instructors, we believe, uh, still can. But you could be a great complement to a good public school totally. music education system where people could also take supplementary right. lessons, which is really the way good music programs work. It's exactly. In fact, I was talking to an audience member. Um, 
just personal experience, we have tried to work with, with different educational systems and school systems, and um, it's pretty hard. <laughs> Those guys don't think exactly like uh, entrepreneurs or move quite, quite as, uh, quite as uh, no, fast as we do, um, to kind of put it bluntly, uh, yet, yeah. uh, as nice as I can. And so we've never been able to cut a deal with a school system to help. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and we're not slowing down. So no. we, we're kind of at a, I would love to, but I just haven't been able to. Well, I think this, I, I repeat the why, but the why is the most important thing because why do people want to st learn music in the first place? That, that's what we have to ask ourselves. Like, why do we want to ki uh, why want, uh, kids take on an instrument? You know, and what, and what should be the end goal of it? Because you, the problem that is there is that, uh, first of all, I mean, music is cut almost in every uh, public school in, in Europe. I mean, in Germany and in Austria and in Switzerland, this is, doesn't look good at all. Mm. Um, and then it's the quality of the tuition, because it's not in an ideal world where we have to get to, should get to, is that no matter the level of proficiency uh, that the kids have, if they want to be professionals, they will have the best education possible, and if they want to be just amateurs, they should also have the best yeah, education, yeah. because you, can, you never know, everybody has a uh, different timeline. Some kids start late, like myself, or, uh, and then you, you never know, you, sometimes you're, you're going through the system and you, you're deemed to be not even musical or whatever, and then you turn out to be exceptional at one thing. So we need to have quality tuitions, tuition from the start. Mm -hmm. No matter if the kid uh, is yeah. going to be professional or not. But I think you make a good point. It feels like there are multiple reasons why you might want to study music. And one thing that's interesting is if you look at affluent families around the world, the one thing they all share is they want their students to study music. They right. want their children to gain some musical skills, not necessarily to be a professional musician. In fact, I'm reminded of the Willie Nelson lyric, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. <laughs> you could substitute musicians for cowboys. Uh, but you know, so there, we, we know now from, from CAT scans that music is probably the most effective way to stimulate multiple sectors of the brain simultaneously. We, we're gonna learn more and more about why we know intuitively that music education is important. So just for human development, learning an instrument and learning to play music is good. For wellness and health and satisfaction and identity, I think it's key. Most of the musicians I know, I don't know, uh, you, you started, you said 15? Yeah, 14. You, it was yeah. a late bloomer, but most of the great musicians I've met practiced a lot when they were in sort of the middle school years. Those schools when you form your identity. But you know, that changed too, so I'd interrupt, because there are some great musicians, uh, pianist examples, from the 1900s, Paderewski or something, they started with 24. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, speaking about different timelines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and to the brain, uh, it's like that, that you're totally right, that music is, is foundation actually for all of those critical, critical thinking, uh, creative, uh, cre creativity and so on. But we have to hear, always think, nowadays most of the uh, music tuition is like this, that the kids are taught how to do a certain task, but not why which is in the piano, for example, you have a sheet music, you have notes on, the, on, on five lines, and they tell you, okay, the C is this key, the G is that key, and so they try to learn and try to play what's there, uh, and, but they don't understand no, right. the modules, they don't understand why they're doing things, and that's the creativity, and so actually music education of that, okay, it stimulates the motoric side, and it, it's good for the brain anyway, but uh, creativity, not so sure. Yeah, I think that I think that adds just to the point to where you know what makes a quality music education program, especially with beginners, and it's not just about getting the notes right. It's also about the emotional appeal that that instructor makes with a student that lets them know, hey, you're okay. Yeah. Hey, it's going to be okay. You're getting better. You're learning, and we find that that personal encouragement is just as important as hitting the right notes. Which kind of takes me to, uh, I, I think, Roger, you were saying this, that we also believe that uh, music is in and of itself an emotional sort of language. And that is best served by humans. And the difference you can tell is if you're playing and uh, there's an app or an AI uh, bot that tells you you're hitting the right notes, well, that feels a certain way. The other way <laughs> is if you're playing 
and you can look in someone's eyes and you see the tears well up because of something that you're doing is a very different sort of experience. And we think that they both something have Something you're to doing that they like or something that really is painful to do. <laughs> yeah. well, it starts there could be painful. two reasons for yeah. that. <laughs> starts off painful and hopefully gets to the one you like down the road. Um, for me, it's still mostly painful. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we think that there's that combination that it, also, it has to be, the quality is, yes, you have to get the notes right, but you also have to be able to tie that emotional appeal to for music. So I'd actually love to dig in on that last point because personalizing learning is a major theme of this conference. It's been a major theme of my writing for over a decade now. Uh, one of the benefits, it seems, from all of the work that you're doing is that you actually can personalize in different ways for people's needs. Um, I'd love you to reflect on how, you're how, how you think about personalization, but I'd love you to reflect also on the flip side of it, which is uh, this year in particular, a major buzzword at the, or buzz phrase at the conference is artificial intelligence. There are a lot of music apps that can teach you without a human being at all. How do you think about those and what's the role or not of, of, of them yeah. in music education? If I could um, just say something to that point with, with the emotion and music. If, from my point of view, th there is no notes without emotion. So if there cannot be music without emotion. Mu music is energy, music is emotion. So everybody who just, teaches you how to play the notes, does it wrong from, uh, from the start. To AI is, um, I'm, I'm, I love computers, I love technology, that, <laughs> always, uh, since I'm a kid. Um, and I think it, it, will, it will do great things. The challenge here is just, um, as in, as in self-driving cars, uh, f philosophers and so on will get different uh, sorts of jobs that they have to do, you know, code morals into the system and so on. We will need, those musicians uh, on, and teachers who still have the patterns in the brain to decipher what's value and what's not to create those systems. Then there might be something beneficial coming from that. So personalization and AI. Big believer in personalization. Every single student that we uh, take in has a personalized lesson plan associated with the instructor. And we also try to match that instructor based on um, genre and style. So we find that there's uh, certain uh, students that work better in more of a reg regimented style. Um, most of them, again, kind of like something fun to start off with. But if you ever try to teach someone who's um, you know, 16 and really interested in rock and roll, um, classical to start with, it's a pain. Like they don't quite connect. And same thing with these different genres. Uh, I, I feel like it, it should be personalized. Uh, that being said, with respect to AI, um, we are a tech company, and we believe that tech can be a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And so it has its place, and uh, there are uh, ways that I believe you can supplement the, the learning, and we think that there's definitely a role there. Um, we believe what we call H2H, which is human to human, is first and foremost the most important way, specifically for music. And uh, you know, AI uh, will be here and we're, we're, we welcome it, but I don't think it takes the, I know it doesn't take the place of being able to have a, a human help you as well. Roger, how do you frame it? Um, well, the, the whole idea of an individualized private lesson is the ultimate form of personalization if the, if the instructor is good. And what we find is maybe more than ever, musicians come to us with really uneven skill sets. Um, because they haven't been in a more formal education system. Many of them are, are very much self-taught or they've, uh, they've had certain exposure. So a good, a good teacher sort of assesses the student and figures out where the gaps are. But I, I would reverse that too and say one thing we've learned in our online music school, because when we started this in 2002, everybody said, you're crazy, how can you teach music online? That's a terrible idea. They're, our own faculty didn't like the idea. But one thing we've learned is that in a, in a cohort, let's say on average of a dozen students, uh, and the students are writing, uh, let's say it's a, a film scoring class, writing music for film or games or TV, the students are much more apt to listen to and constructively critique one another's work in an online class than they are in a physical classroom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is. It could happen in a physical classroom, but. Online, it just facilitates more peer interaction and more peer review. 
And I have to say, it's, it's really encouraging how constructive people are and, and loving they are with each other. Because when the online school, we get some people who are professionals and we get some people who are beginners. So you have a wider range of skill sets than you might have in a, in a physical classroom where everyone is past the same kind of admission standards through an audition. So I don't know, I, I think there, there's both a personalization piece of this, but I think there's also a peer learning piece that's really important, and maybe that's what you're getting in some of those streamed lessons, I yeah, don't know. And definitely, so in the live stream classes, the, the class is important, and the instructor obviously is important. What we've found that um, I think ties to what you're saying is that the community surrounding the class is just as important. Um, they, our students will form meetup groups outside of class to study and learn uh, one kind of amongst themselves. And I think that just that sense of belonging uh, and sense of learning is just as important as what they're learning in the class. Yeah, when I, if I can just go back to the genres because um, I know uh, classical music and, and these genres, these drawers have become uh, ubiquitous everywhere. My personal opinion about music is that there is only music. Of course, we need to be a human, so we need to put labels on it and so on. But, um, for example, I have experience with kids uh, who exactly that. They are interested in, in rock or, or, or Frank Sinatra or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you actually introduce them to a classical piece that they don't know, so it's also new for them. And you make it really cool. It's, it's really catching on with them. So when you say make it really cool... How yes. do you do that? So what, exactly. what would be like this? That's the point, because the, the last, in the last 50 years, that's why I'm saying we are living in the dark ages, because the last 50 years, especially classical music, has become a sport. Uh, right. And it, it shouldn't be. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, but it is. So it's hitting you the mean right in terms notes. of the competition, in terms of no, the rat race, not or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was like, with, uh, as, as I say, uh, you know, even if you win in a hamster wheel, you're still a hamster. <laughs> so it's, it, that's what's happening in classical music. And, uh, but it's happening in other genres too, I think. Because if you look at jazz pianists, look at Art Tatum and uh, Oscar Peterson and compare them with the best nowadays, it's a different ball game. As it is with, uh, in, in, they're always outliers, of course, but uh, sure. generally. So, um, so where I came from is that that by really making it cool means really play music freely because all the, <laughs> for example, take Mozart. Mozart was not uh, a boring guy. He was quite quite sarcastic and maybe not as he's um, portrayed uh, in, in that movie, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. but he definitely was uh, sarcastic and had. Uh, tons of imagination, and this music has too. And what did we do the last 100 or 200 years, last 100 years I recorded, we make it boring as hell. So no, no wonder why kids don't respond to that. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to really do. So I'm, I, I am sensing a bit of a tension though, because I, I, I hear this theme of sort of dark ages of music, but I also see that there seems like there's a lot of demand out there for music and that people can't access it for affordability reasons. I mean, these are all the problems that you're solving and you all are serving enormous numbers of students. So I'm, 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 I'm struggling a little bit with this reality because it seems like the demand actually is there. What, what, what's holding, a, like what, what's causing us in your opinion to sort of be in that dark ages? And, and yeah, I, maybe, maybe let's start there. And do you all agree with that? I mean from my perspective, it's a fixed mindset. It's the, that people, you know, for generations now, the last 50 years, it has been handed on to the next generation and one mediocre uh, educated teacher gave his mediocre knowledge to the next one and he taught the next one, the next one. I mean, I'm here, of course, a bit exaggerating, but not much. Mm -hmm. It's really this way. And that's why we are where we are. We need to give the people a voice that that still have the patterns in the brain stored, that they know what makes music cool, what makes music good, and there are people. We just have to give them a voice. So we have tens of thousands of instructors on our site and have worked with hundreds of thousands over the course of the past 10 years that we've been in business. Um, we've, we've developed out some pretty cool technology that in essence we track uh, every single lesson that goes on, we track the results, both quantitative uh, and qualitative, from the eye of the user, the eye of the student, and um, we track retention of that individualized teacher to the point to where we can tell which instructors are doing well over time and which ones are pretty much doing terrible. And the ones that are doing poorly, we just kind of 
remove them from our search to where pe people can't find them any longer, <laughs> and they go away. Uh, and so we have kind of this self-selection process and we're, that we're very proud of because, you know, to your point, we think that, um, that the, instructor, you know, the instructor does matter and how they go about teaching matters. And so we've tried to build a technology that allows the best to kind of shine through uh, and capture that demand uh, coming in and then place them with the, with the right instructor. Um, you know, again, not every, not every instructor, frankly, should be an instructor. Um, and I think in music it's a little bit more loose because you know, we have a, a guy that, that played guitar with Lenny Kravitz who never, went, never finished high school. And he is an incredible artist, musician, and can run circles around some of our instructors with PhDs. So you have to take those sorts of things into account when, when thinking through with, with music because it does go back to emotion Absolutely. and passion as well. Mm -hmm. Paper inflation, we yeah. don't live in time. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic with, with Ingolf's concerns, but I'm a little more optimistic. You know, I think that um, Berkeley, the way we define our job is to not prescribe aesthetics to our students, but to empower them to make the kind of music they want. And some want to go to Brooklyn and do esoteric free jazz that very few people are going to listen to, and they're never going to get a record label deal and no one's going to ever hear their music on the radio. And then we have other people who want to be pop stars like Imagine Dragons or Charlie Puth. And I sort of feel like it's not my job to judge them. It's my job to create an environment in which they can get a toolkit and they can get inspiration and form a community that gives them the courage to go out there and do it. And it's a hard way to make a living. So I sort of feel like let's support them as best we can. And one of the ways, and we were talking about this, a lot of our alumni probably teach, they teach on, with us, on, yeah. on your system, um, which I think is great because almost every working musician I know teaches some lessons. If they're super successful, they may stop, but most middle class musicians teach some lessons. That's a, one of the ways they make a living. And I think that's a beautiful thing about the apprenticeship history of, the, uh, of music is that it, it often is passed from one teacher to, uh, to a student. And then we, we could talk about what are some of the pathologies in music, and certainly the, the Napster era kind of knocked, uh, knocked the wind out of the industry from a commercial point of view, but it's really coming back it's with coming streaming. Back yeah. There are now two $20 billion plus market cap streaming companies in the world, and there are a couple that are owned by Amazon and Apple. We don't know what they would be worth if they were independent, but we're monetizing music again, and I tell you, the thing that, that if you, know, you travel around the world, people's interest in music is not dissipated one iota. Maybe the way they make it, the kind of music they make has changed, but... Um. Yeah, so just I, for the record, I am optimistic, very <laughs> much so. Okay. <laughs> what's, well. what's fueling the optimism? I want it on the record. No, because we can turn it around. Because we can turn That's it around. That's the thing, because there are, there are people who, who should be empowered, who can deliver that to masses, so... But so, so it sounds like, you know, given your passion about this, how do you select the instructors who you think are going to be the, the people who infuse the music with its meaning and emotion and not just train, you know, monkeys to, to recapitulate? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now we are at the very start, so we do that manually. But we have uh, f uh, plans as soon as we start scaling up to um, have algorithms and, uh, and things to do that. Yeah. Because it and does feel like that matching is probably a critical thing. Because exactly. as you said, some people, some people like to learn step by step. Yeah. And other people don't want to go in the right order. So it, it, I, I do yeah. think that, that sort of individualization Absolutely. is key. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's one interesting. Thing we tell our, yeah. One thing we tell our instructors, we kind of have like this onboarding uh, role for them. And one thing we say is, I know when you play, it's about you. But when you teach, it's really about them. And I think that's kind of the message we send, not in those exact words, but it's really trying to figure out what is important to that student, whether they're five or 95, and trying to serve them the best way that they get the appreciation for music that, that you do. So I'm, I'm curious, one other question um, that, that seems to be undercutting this is this virtual versus in-person uh, and, and group dynamics. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you think about, I mean, there's a very disruptive innovation story here, which I love, which is that the virtual and the online is extending access. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you think about the trade-offs or opportunities? Because you were talking about actually in some ways the virtual piece actually brings out elements that are harder to do in person. How do you think about the trade-offs and opportunities of those two mediums? 
How many times have we been at restaurants where a family of four sits there and they're all on their devices? <laughs> I think we've got a generation coming along for whom the distinction is, is not that real. Um, and so I think if you teach online with a good teacher, I think to the average young person, that's just as powerful as if they were in the same room with the person. And then I also think you probably get an archive of recorded lessons. I know when I would take lessons, I would run home excited to try out the things I'd learned, and I felt like I'd forgotten a bunch yeah. of it. Yeah. So the ability to go watch the lesson again or to have multiple camera angles, uh, angles on the hand position or the feet, especially I'm a drummer, there are a lot of limbs that you use in drumming, and it's hard to watch them all at once. So to be able to isolate the different limbs and hand position and posture, all those things, it feels like a good online lesson could capture that in some ways better than a human being could do it in person. You could rewatch it and reuse it. So I think, and I also think, if you want to study like shred metal guitar and you're in Peoria, you can probably find a guitar teacher, but you probably yeah. can't find a great shredder, maybe in Peoria. I don't know. I don't mean to insult Peoria, but it's where, my dad's where I grew up, where I, in, 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 I grew up in a little town in Georgia. Yeah. I took piano lessons, but I, 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 there wasn't anybody I knew of teaching drums, much less uh, some esoteric thing like, say, Latin drumming or, or uh, heavy metal drumming or some, some niche like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. So we've been testing online since 2012. And at the beginning, the experience, frankly, was pretty terrible. Mm. Um, uh, you take a look at just the internet speeds, even from 2012 to now, has increased tremendously. 5G is right around the corner, which will uh, uh, continue to allow for uh, allow you to learn wherever you are on whatever device that you're that you're looking for. So we see online as an opportunity for people to uh, to to connect. Right now, if you wanted to learn, whatever that is, you, are, uh, you can only learn from people within your like five mile radius. That's who you have to pick from. And with online, I have a, a, a drummer. He is 95 years old. He lives in Minnetonka, Minnesota. And he is taking lessons with a guy in LA because they match and he's learning the way that he wants to learn. And we think that online opens those sorts of opportunities. Um, there are some things that are better in person. Like I personally would prefer, if I could, to get to get that exact person, uh, you know, right here in my in my living room. But they're not always uh, that option doesn't exist. And so, given that uh, that uh, kind of that differential, online opens a world of possibility. Uh, we have people all over the world who are taking. Um, private as well as group lessons from incredible instructors that they would just simply would never have that opportunity before. So the idea of shutting them out because it's not in person is frankly, like in my view, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But open the world. Yeah, it's not much to add, I agree. Um, I teach myself also online uh, and it, it absolutely works. Everybody that, um, that says it's not possible, uh, it's wrong. There's evidence so to if, the contrary. if you know your craft, you can do it and, and people react. As in, especially the young, uh, as in real life, and yeah. uh, there is not much distinction. But of course, you have always this this personal, I don't know, brain waves that yeah. you cannot yet, um, yeah. cannot yet uh, deliver over the internet. Who knows when that will come? <laughs> but uh, so so in person is cool, and whenever possible, it's great. Yeah. But and, and you don't have to do either or. You could do largely yeah. online, and then twice a year you could go spend a half a day with your teacher. Or a course, or a yeah. summer camp, yeah. or So I think, again, I think we have this, this dichotomous view of online versus in-person education, and I think the models of the future are going to be more blended. Yeah. And um, so you, you maybe, maybe you build the relationship over time in person, but then you do some of, the, some of the, the work you can do virtually, and it's a lot more convenient, a lot less travel, mm -hmm. all, all sorts of e ways to make it easier. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. I'll say a phrase I've always loved is when words end, music begins. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think uh, this is a personal statement, but I think that the rest of education has a lot to learn, frankly, from good music education. Uh, and so I hope music is the beginning of uh, a, a broader statement of what education can look like more broadly in our world. So uh, will you join me in uh, thanking the panelists for this great time? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.